welcome back dear students uh, good afternoon today i am going to have the sixth lecture on law and economics uh, this lecture is basically on designing efficient property law we had already discussed about um, the economic uh, theory of property as well as uh, the legal theory of property now we, our concern is largely on designing efficient property law so how we are going to do that is a question that is how do we design an efficient property law system is a very very important one for that we have actually a sub question of four uh, such as uh, what can be privately owned what can an owner do with the property how are property rights established and what remedies are given these four questions are very important because uh, what can be privately owned uh, is uh, a question which comes uh, basically within this one and uh, we had already aware of this fact and what can an owner do with the property is also we discussed in the early lectures and how our property right established so these are uh, the legal aspect of that has been already been reflected but what is about the economic aspect and uh, before coming to this question we need to clarify that the positive transaction cost and how it could be understood and remedied so this is actually the baseline of establishment the the, the rationalization of the establishment of property right as far as uh, the uh, law and lit economics literature is concerned therefore we need to talk about the different types or source of transaction cost which most of you know about and in the it uh, transaction cost literature especially if you take any book such as uh, kutter and nolan or even economic analysis or law by posner or foundation of economic analysis by steven shavel or any standard textbook which uh, you uh, read all this is basically uh, stress upon a fact that a transaction cost is a cost of governance okay or people try to say the transaction cost is a cost of transaction all right so in that uh, broader understanding normally there are uh, in a segregated uh, uh, cost uh, under this blanket uh, statement such as uh, there are three types of major cost which is normally been defined under the uh, law and economics literature especially any textbook like kutter and nolan the first one is search cost and then you have uh, 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 then you have enforcement cost and uh, the third one is actually the bargaining cost so these are the three cost which is normally everyone talks about so let us talk about one by one so we all know that what is search cost search cost is nothing but for uh, finding a new market for finding a consumer a proper producer etc proper commodity etc requires some sort of search so that itself is basically um, uh, comes with the cost so in that context you know how this cost been reflected in the commodity price normally this cannot be from the producer's angle this cannot be actually directly comes under the uh, price of the commodity but however some way or the other normally this kind of things will come into but that portion we will be discussing later so such costs are involved so that cost is basically comes under this category of search cost the second one is bargaining cost normally this is a very important cost because uh, buying a commodity you you have uh, you, uh, you have different problems such as asymmetry of information or adverse selection then you have a problem of private information which we not knowing each other's threat point then you have also problem of uncertainty about property rights which is also act as a threat point and a large number of buyers or sellers hold out and uh, free riding etc so these are the issues normally people uh, confront so again the hostility problem so we don't know what is actually uh, with the commodity transaction so there is a lot of uncertainty in the process of basically obtaining or giving up a commodity so in that so, uh, sense these are actually the cost comes under bargaining this is actually away from the uh, re, uh, the, the realistic uh, sorry the, the idealistic world where 
people are very nice economic uh, agents are well behaved etc but in this context people are not necessarily very um, good because this is the hobbesian system which we will come to later talks about people are brutish nasty and selfish kind of and uh, you know premise so in that premise only you have this issue of bargaining you have the issue of control you have the issue of basically looking after the economic transaction there do comes a cost and that cost is also comes under the transaction cost so this is the second set of cost which is normally brought in uh, the transaction cost framework by Kutcher and Ullen and other economists and the third one is called the enforcement cost and the enforcement cost is also we know that so once you make it bargaining or search everything and all then you found out that you know the whatever you you uh, came into or the terms which you arrived may not be basically you know met or there is a breach and all happens if there is a breach or some sort of you know uh, if somebody not kept their uh, promise as they promised uh, or somebody refrains from whatever they supposed to do and all so in that context you know how do we ensure that this is going to be you know um, uh, this is not going to happen so if that is the case then you have to basically have a sort of uh, cost involved which is called the enforcement cost this is the third set of cost which also deals with the, the transaction cost so if you are aware of all the three then you have now a rough idea of what is actually uh, transaction cost so the transaction cost is in that sense is legitimize the fact that uh, there is a lot of uh, cost involved when uh, there is a resource transaction takes place so uh, to normative approach to property normally uh, try to you know address this problem okay so this is what is actually the question which we asked in the beginning that is how do we have an efficient uh, property right law so uh, in that context uh, designing the law to minimize transaction cost would be the first objective of this uh, sort of a question which we noted earlier so why why this is uh, important so design the law to minimize transaction cost uh, make some sort of sense because structure the law what is this design the law to minimize transaction now we know that the three types of cost is real cost and that cost is not actually a trivial and it is going to play a very crucial role in the real world uh, transactions therefore what would be our objective so first objective is uh, economists try to say that let's minimize this transaction cost so in order to minimize transaction cost uh, you may be having a law which is basically talks about the um, minimization of transaction so you design a law to minimize transaction cost so how do we propose it uh, structure the law so as to remove the impediments to private agreement so this is a kind of uh, proposition which uh, uh, cost uh, uh, cost uh, article reflects on that is uh, this is what is largely Kutter and other economists developed as normative cost theorem so uh, in the textbook also you can see uh, this uh, very interesting way of presenting it so what does actually here uh, this law do law basically lubricates bargaining it is like to facilitate bargaining so what is actually you need a law because uh, the transaction cost is too high otherwise and the law is basically in order to structure the uh, structure to minimize this loose transaction cost this is the first idea which comes under this designing the law to minimize transaction cost principle and this is comes under the purview of normative cost but at the same time try to allocate the, the, but at the same time there are other problems also you know it is not most of the time we know that you know people uh, uh, are actually uh, you know uh, only lubrication is required there are sometimes you know people are not ready to even give up their resources all right so uh, there are issues of allocation so, so in the real world this issues of allocation is very very important and uh, to address that problem you have a second objective or second sort of understanding coming to play which is try to allocate rights efficiently to start with so bargaining doesn't matter that much 
So what is actually this principle says you definitely you should have an efficient allocation in the beginning itself. So what they are going to do is structure the law so as to minimize the harm caused by failures in private agreement. So what is actually, of course, you are uh, tend to uh, fail. That is in the, the Hobbesian version, we have already seen that, you know, people are brutish, nasty and selfish. If they act like that, then see, uh, no bargaining is going to be very sustainable. So no, no transaction is going to be very nice and uh, because people are not nice so this is the system so what so your agreements are tend to fail and therefore you have to basically look after even after the agreement take place because there is a lot of challenge uh, so what you have to do is actually you give the uh, you give the property or uh, resources to those hand where it is efficiently you know basically deals with so this is why this principle of structure the law so as to minimize the harm caused by failures in private agreement uh, emphasize on. So this is what is normally comes uh, or discussed in the Kutrenulen as normative Hobbes theorem. So which approach should we use is the next question. It's a billion dollar question in fact. Why? Because now you have two problems. One is actually a, a facilitator job. The other one is actually a controller job. So uh, now this is actually something to do with uh, the real world transaction too. So um, compare, uh, let us uh, now uh, compare cost of each approach and then we will be arriving at uh, uh, a conclusion that when we have to go for the, the facilitator role or the, the controller role or the Hobbes normative Hobbes theorem or the application of normative cost theorem. So this is what is now we are going to discuss now. Let us start with the normative cost here. That is cost of transacting and remaining inefficiencies is the question. And normative Hobbes theorem is cost of figuring out how to allocate rights efficiently, information cost, etc. or whatever. So this is what is actually the cost which is in, in uh, the important cost which involved under this two category. That is normative cost theorem is actually sometime we very much bothered about this cost of transacting and remaining inefficiencies. Whereas this these people have a problem with the cost of configuring or figuring out how to allocate right efficiently. Now, when transaction costs are low and information costs are high, so structure the law so as to minimize transaction costs is a proposition made by people. Especially in the textbook, normally law and economics, people used to say that when you have a smaller transaction cost, that means uh, when it is a close knitted community where the possibility of transaction cost is so low, then what is actually more important information costs are very high there. So, though even if it is a smaller uh, set of people who are interacting, but the cost information cost which they supposed to have about the commodity is maybe very high. Though the interaction may be very less. So in that situation, what you have to do is actually the structure the law so as to minimize transaction cost principle may be applied. That is the normative cost here, cost here and can be applied. And that is going to be a, a better one. On the contrary, when transaction costs are very high, for example, even if it is a small uh, group of people, but they never agree each other or actually coming together by themselves is very difficult where the information uh, is not a problem uh, for example so information is uh, doesn't matter uh, for them but they are not ready to come together so at that type of a situation what you have to do is actually the structure below to allocate property right to whoever value them the most so this is actually a kind of normative Hobbes theorem proposes. So now you have two principles say that when you have to apply this thing. So the first one says that if transaction cost is too low, but information cost is too high, then you have to go for the normative cost theorem. At the same time, if transaction cost is too high and information cost is too low, then it is better to have actually an allocation property right. Which, which is property right matters in that context. So this is what that is, uh, you have to give more priority to 
you know institution in that context so now we have one general principle we can use for designing property law in a nutshell that when transaction costs are low design the law to facilitate voluntary trade when transaction cost is high design the law to allocate right efficiently whenever possible so this is that is uh, in a nutshell if you know that there are high transaction costs involved in what you have to do property right matters if there is a low transaction cost it doesn't matter so this is what was actually initially cost was uh, mentioning also so the next question we normally um, follow from this is choosing a remedy for property rights violation so uh, there are many uh, uh, relief uh, generally applicable uh, in the real world but we we pick a major one uh, first one is actually uh, the injunctive relief uh, court clarifies right <coughs> barred future violation <coughs> excuse me <coughs> court clarifies right or future violation that is violations are punished as crimes so this is what is called uh, comes under the uh, injunctive relief where the very interesting thing is that right is tradable under this particular context so uh, even uh, injunctive relief as a remedy to property right is a very yeah, crucial point because court clarify right bars future violation violation are punished as crime because uh, the right is tradable okay however the right is tradable so the second one is uh, trying to talk about the damages so court determines how much harm was done by violation award payment to injury so these are two different approach normally people try to um, you know adopt in real world that is as a remedy of property right violation you can either have an injunctive relief or a damage so why we should have an injunctive relief because injunctive relief is actually stops uh, the violation from that point onwards okay so uh, it is a priori stops the violation okay if after that also if you violate then it is treated as a crime which is against the state whereas a damage is nothing but it is actually uh, a thing which is happens a posteriori that is if a violation takes place then uh, it talks about okay what what is next now it's already taken place okay with uh, now how much you can actually pay for it so costs uh, uh, should be equally efficient if there are no transactions. For this, these two things are actually discussed under the paper social problem, social cost by cost. And he discussed also the fact that you no, know, uh, it doesn't matter which one you uh, apply injunctive relief or damage. If there is no transaction cost for a smaller, no, uh, yeah, the, when in the absence of transaction cost. Whether you give an injunctive relief or damage makes no difference. So this is what the pro, uh, pro principle which uh, he was actually referring in an idealistic sense. But in real world, which one is more uh, efficient is what is our understanding because this is where being discussed by many economists at, 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 at the least in the beginning. Um, Judo Galabrasi or Gaido, uh, Judo Galabrasi and uh, Malamate, uh, 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 they wrote a paper on this and they, their paper is basically treat property and liability under a common framework. They say that, okay, let's talk about different uh, institutions such as a property uh, contract and uh, that is and the liability rule uh, and then see what is actually the difference between this in different circumstances. So this is what is actually they were discussing in this paper. 1972 property rules, liability rule, and inalienability. One view over of the cathedral. So, what is uh, the, fir the first concern? Let us talk about the liability. Is the ransom liable for the damage done by his red? This is the first question. Normally, we the same example has been given by of course the ranger farmer example. So, we know that uh, the 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 first question that is if the uh, herds do some harm to uh, the farm uh, then who is actually liable is the rancher or the ranch so uh, under the property rule uh, again does the farmer's right to his property include the right to be free from trespassing costs this is again a question 
So if you look into liability, who is actually liable of what? Is the question again in the properties context or uh, if you look into then what you understand is that whether the farmer is free from uh, 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 getting whatever you know free from trespassing because trespass from the cows uh, trespass I was trespassing cows so this is a question not many somebody asks so if that is the case then there are the other sort of given system which we have already discussed earlier that is entitlements so who what is actually the farmer entitled without is the farmer entitled to land free from trespassing animal this question is very important so if two people are there a, a rancher and a farmer in the same vicinity so if a rancher uh, race herds uh, then naturally it will go for ranching and uh, it may end up in the field also so at the same time if the farmer is also having uh, the farm but uh, they cannot actually go and uh, do harm to the ranch because the farm is an immobile place this is what is normally we think so in that context if you have these two questions comes it uh, comes into picture then this is actually makes some sort of sense in that sense okay so uh, who is entitled to what is the question so which is a very very important one or is the rancher entitled to the natural action of his cattle now if uh, naturally we know that any ranch uh, 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 ranches actually always goes for grazing and this is uh, the rancher is as entitled as uh, the farmer who can actually farm he can grow uh, he can cultivate uh, same is actually about the the, the the shepherds or the cattle rearers etc so this question is therefore is not actually uh, something trivial so the entitlement is actually uh, 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 it, it, it uh, prop up here in this context and the three possible way to protect an entitlement in the real uh, understanding that is first one is we had already discussed this is called the property rule or injunctive relief all right so injunction that's a uh, warning that you, you you cannot enter into somebody's uh, property so this is what is uh, the property here or the person who is having property is now uh, being protected by this law or injunctive relief is gives some sort of protection if there is a violation of my entitlement say the farmer's entitlement is punished as crime okay then injunction is actually court order clarifies the right and specifically barring any future violation all right so but entitlement is negotiable at the same time when i am saying that okay let's now uh, uh, your ranch comes in and uh, destroy my f uh, field then uh, i can negotiate on the contrary so entitlement doesn't mean that i cannot actually uh, give this is an inalien uh, the, the property of inalienability is not actually there with entitlement entitlement can be taken also it is negotiable so i can choose to sell uh, give up my right etc so this is what is actually comes under the entitlement which we had already discussed in the lecture fourth uh, the, in the in the uh, a fourth lecture and the big okay so uh, the liability rule on the contrary or the damage is something after the incident takes place then you assess the loss and then you try to um, compensate so violation of my entitlement are compensated here so in the property it is curbs the other person from using your property all right and if there is a violation to be treated as a crime whereas under the liability rule if there is a damage takes place which is always been assessed posterior not a priori okay and then violation of entitlement are compensated accordingly and damage where you try to say that a payment to the victim to compensate for damage done so this is what is actually the case and on the contrary the third problem which in the paper talk about is the inalienability the non separable Thing. so violation punished as crime very simple if you have a violation then it is a crime against the state unlike property entitlement cannot be sold so property rule in that sense you can trade that is because it is an entitlement whereas an inalienable right is not for sale for example if i am in an office 
then I can't trade my office to anybody, but I can actually uh, assign somebody, uh, uh, you know, the work can be, you know, uh, outsourced, but this office cannot be given to somebody else, which is illegal, which is a punishable offense in that sense. So, so non-inalienability is the most important aspect of this thing. So uh, this is also in the real world, uh, the same uh, issues being treated and uh, uh, now let us talk about the comp the prop property injunctive relief or comparing the property or injunctive relief to liability and damage rule. So then we will see that what is actually the difference between the two. Now in the in uh, there are certain uh, concepts. First of all, we have to be really clear about one is injury. That is a person who a, 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 whose entitlement is being violated. That is the injury always prefer a property because if I am entitled then I always try to uh, not to be violated so I always being a property owner I prefer property okay at the same time for an injurer somebody who is actually violates someone's right he or she always prefer a damage rule you know whatever damage I have done uh, I'll be compensated, right? It's perfectly rational, rationalizable, rationalizable for them uh, uh, to go for this particular thing. So the question therefore comes as why. So punishment for violating a property rule is severe if the two sides need to negotiate to trade the right injurious threat point is lower, even if both rules eventually lead to. Uh, same outcome injured may have to pay more under this circumstance. So let's comparing injunctive relief to damage example. Suppose there is an electric company E emits smoke uh, dirty the laundry at the laundromat L next door E earns a profit of thousand. Then without a smoke L earns a profit of three hundred. So smoke reduces L's profit to a hundred. Uh, okay, and E could stop looting at a cost of 500. So L could prevent the damage at a cost of 100, right? Now, this is actually the numbers which you have to keep in mind. E is a electric company's profit is equal to 1000, uh, profit is uh, the laundromat's profit is uh, 300, uh, which will be if there is a pollution, uh, reduces to 100. If prevention measures, then 500 uh, for electric company and L prevents the same. Um, by installing a filter or something to 100. So this is actually the number which we have to keep in mind. So now suppose if the first rule, polluters right, okay, no revenue, nothing you will get. So if that is the situation, then E, that is the electric company earns 1000 rupees and L install a filter and earns a uh, profit of 200 because uh, otherwise uh, by pollution uh, this is going to be 100 and then the total would be 100 and uh, thousand and uh, 1100 so that for an ill it is always better under a no right premise that is no remedy premise uh, to always go for a filter and increase the profitability so laundromat has now let us actually reverse some introduce the right into someone whether that changes anything or not is the question so laundromat is having right to damage now so if that is the case then he earns 1000 rupees pays damage of 200 which is actually reduces to 800 for the electric company what is the result l earns 100 gets a damage of 200 so the total is 300 so the total profit is in this situation uh, 1100 now what about the loan the bank has the right of uh, to injunction that is to stop the uh, electric production so that is the case then E is compelled to install a uh, scrubber or the um, then uh, that reduces actually uh, say uh, 100 uh, 500 uh, rupees uh, as a cost and uh, which will be reduced from uh, the profit or which will be deducted from the profit that is 1000 minus 500 which is equal to 500 is now the net profit so 
L ends that is the long term math ends 300. So what is the result? This is the result. So uh, in the polluters write uh, the total profit of the combined profit of the two player is 200 and uh, 1200 where under the damage rule it is 1100 under the injunction it is 800 all right so this is a non-cooperative payoff so this is the most important point suppose we introduce a cooperation of bargaining in that sense so suppose uh, gains from cooperation here is because of no cooperation uh, non-cooperation what is actually the result zero and what about the the cooperation if there is a cooperation takes place then what happens suppose the polluter is having the right then they produce thousand and uh, L pays a 200 the output also combined output is actually 1200 also. so whether no right situation whether you have uh, right so the polluters right is actually tells that the other receiving end guys doesn't have actually any right so what do that if that is the best thing then if actually that is the cost minimizing then uh, there is nothing you gain from cooperation okay otherwise under a damage rule if there is a possibility of cooperation then there is a cooperative surplus which you can create how it is that possible so suppose you pay off a cooperation which is 800 plus 1 by 2 of 100 as well as 300 plus 1 by 2 of 100 which is nothing but again you can create a 850 instead of 800 you buy cooperation uh, uh, in the minimum context that you share the profit so what this is going to have is like uh, this guy is going to give some money and ask the person uh, to install a filter so what the other person says that okay what is my benefit if uh, if uh, electric person is persuades uh, the the farmer to or the laundromat to install a filter and uh, he or she offers some plus money then that is going to basically increase the total profitability into 100 1200 so this is why in a in a very liberal sense uh, 850 50 50 if they share the profit 50 50 then uh, electric company gets 850 as well as the laundromat gets a 350 look at the difference of the distribution right see the first one one person is thousand thousand the other 200 the second case now 850 the other guy gets 300 and because it is actually damages and now look at uh, if the injunctive relief is placed if injunctive relief uh, then who is having the right injunctive relief means uh, the the farmer is having uh, sorry the laundromat is having right so or uh, that is the kind so uh, what there the property rule is actually says that okay you have to install a scrubber okay so that means that comes with a high cost now if i would install that then this is actually the result like 500 and 300 total is actually 800 but if i am very wise then what i do is actually i'll go and ask the person to just uh, install a filter so the person again asks that okay what is the point of basically having all this thing so he is he offer a very high amount instead of the earlier one and um, so if that is at, at the uh, least the 50 50 they share then what they get is actually this 500 plus 1 by 1 by 2 400 which is 200 that is 700 and uh, this, this guy is getting actually 300 plus 1 by 4 of uh, uh, 400 which is actually 500 see the total surplus in this case look at this total surplus see this is total profitability total profitability for all the people all the all this incident is one of the same that is 1200 is the maximum profit which you can earn the distribution of this profitability or uh, the distribution of the share 
in the first polluters right the uh, the uh, the person that is the electric company gets a huge profit and division between profit and uh, the uh, the profit of the electric company with the um, uh, laundry math but in the last one injunctive case electric company's profitability and the um, laundry math's profitability is almost equally distributed and in damage also you know there are different uh, uh, difference but still it is actually less uh, greater than the polluters right so the distribution now uh, is different to that of uh, uh, the the other case this is very very important and uh, no so that that doesn't mean that the, maybe the total uh, result would be one the same but doesn't mean that actually the distribution is one and you know, distribution in the real world technically if we say that there is no problem um, then uh, there is no problem but uh, but in real world there is an issue of a sort of uh, you know um, distributive impact which is uh, affect the behavior of the individual or the business people so it may give a higher incentive or a lower incentive to the producer etc all this argument is actually standard we will come to that later so comparing injunction to damages in this context that injunctions are generally cheaper to administer now how we understand that which one is so for as we began that is uh, for the injured it is always uh, favorable uh, for asking for an injunctive relief or the property rule but for an inju injurer it is always asked for uh, either his right or at the least uh, 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 at the least the other one that is uh, yeah damage rule so injunctions are generally cheaper to administer no need for court to calculate amount of harm so let us actually give an injunction if there is an infringement the court you just go plead the court and the court will give you an injunction because your property has been violated it's very easy to basically administer whereas damage is generally more efficient when private bargaining is impossible uh, but the three possibility that the injurer prevents harm injury prevents harm nobody prevents harm some someone pays for it and uh, that is why efficiency and cheapest of the three so damages then injurer in, injurer can prevent harm or pay for it and injurer choose whichever is cheapest in the injunction injurer can only prevent harm so this is the point which we have to uh, understand now we know that any rule leads to efficient outcome when transaction cost are low this is the proposition we began with that is any rule leads to efficient outcome when transaction costs are low injunctions are cheaper to implement damage lead to more efficient outcome when transaction costs are high so leads calibers and element to follow in this conclusion that is when transaction costs are low a property rule is more efficient okay and when transaction costs are very low transaction costs are low property rule is uh, more efficient that is injunctive relief when transaction costs are high that is when transaction costs are too high liability rule is more efficient so this is completely different to that of what we understood right high transaction cost high transaction cost damage leads to damage so high when transaction cost high damage is the best thing low transaction cost means injunctive relief so private bargaining is unlikely to succeed in dispute involving a large number of geographic dispersed strangers because communication costs are high monitoring is costly and strategy will likely to occur large number of landowners are typically affected by nuisance such as air pollution or the stench from the feed lots in these cases damages are preferred remedy because it's too are uh, high transaction costs on the other hand property disputes generally involve a small number of parties who live near each other and can monitor each other's behavior risky after reaching a deal so injunctive relief is the relief is usually used in these cases so this is what you had learned from code renewlands textbook so a different view of high transaction cost case now let us is this is all true 
the question so when transaction was preclude bargain suppose you have a way this is well and good that if you have this principle then this can be formulated but when transaction cost preclude bargaining the court should protect the right by an injunctive remedy if it knows which party values the right relatively more and it does not know how much either party values it absolutely so conversely the court should protect a right by damage remedy if it knows how much one the party values the right absolutely and it does not know which party values the relative it relatively more so it, this is completely the opposite of what we said this is also a kind of situation which we see in the court so what is actually the the, the uh, baseline baseline is when you have a low transaction cost injunctive relief as we said earlier cheaper for the court to administer etc with the low transaction cost we expect parties to negotiate privately if the right is not assigned efficient sorry i would like to say that this is actually a conclusion which is a different version of the conclusion of what uh, uh, malmi and calibrasi uh, could say do they really is the question which we need to really address this is what is actually the standard way of looking at in what funds worth book paper that is does party a parties to no essence cases bargain after judgment a glimpse inside the cathedral paper is a very interesting paper which was talked about a complete different story that is he or uh, addressed the 20 no essence case no bargain after judgment so in almost every case the lawyer said that the acrimony between the parties was an important obstacle to bargain so even after this thing people are not ready to talk if people are not ready to talk how do this is going to helpful so frequently the parties were not on speaking terms so the second uh, recurring obstacle involves uh, the parties uh, this inclination to think of the right at stake as readily commensurable with cash so these are the issues and the third way to protect an indictment uh, is called the inalienability so in the in the paper which we discussed earlier said that you know, though this is ideally right to argue but not necessarily always occurs when uh, the situation when the the people's mindset or behavior is different okay so uh, that's about the uh, the the property rule and liability rule let's talk about the inalienability case okay so inalienability when an entitlement is not transferable or saleable or saleable so allocative externality which is called an enriched uranium example and then we will come to that and then indirect externality human organ transplantation and the third one is a paternalism exam so we will go we will discuss about these three aspects okay so let us uh, 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 go to a, a, a case which is called the shankai daily case uh, which was reported in little early like in 2011 okay a boy regret selling his kidney to buy ipad okay this is an example uh, a 17 year old student in anhui province sold one of his kidney for 20 yuan or only to buy an ipad too now with the, his health getting worse the boy is feeling regret but it is too late the global times report today so i want to buy an ipad too but could not afford it said the boy and uh, surname uh, surname is zheng and uh, Hushan city so a broker contacted me on the internet and said he could help me sell the kidney to the thousand yuan okay so on april 8 shen went to uh, shenzhou city in neighbor neighboring hunan province uh, for the kidney removal surgery arranged by the broker his parents knew nothing about it and shen said he was paid 22000 yuan after his right kidney was taken out at the uh, jenzao number 198 hospital so when he returned home his mother found out and reported to the police immediately but they could not locate the broker whose cell phone was always power off the report said it turns out that the jenzao number 198 hospital was not qualified to perform organ transplant the hospital claimed they had no idea about jen surgery because the uh, 
department that did the surgery had been contracted to a Fujian businessman. So the case is still under investigation. This is the case. So this is something about the inalienable right. So can we basically uh, give up, give up our or give away our organs? So this is uh, an indirect external example of uh, the case. Uh, the first one is uh, about the allocative externality. That is, can a person keep a uranium and trade and trade? Of course, you you say that okay. Uh, if you can have uh, uranium in hand, uranium is having an allocative externality because uranium is not really uh, going to make you problem. You you heard about uh, Mary Curie, right? She keep uranium to get her hand always warm in her pocket so finally what happened she got cancer and she was not only that there are other people also may get affected by that so and not only that this is highly you know, toxic it is highly a radiation based system so can we really keep that kind of thing so you are not uh, uh, if some companies are having the right to, to trade can they trade it to others to handle the same so always there is a question comes that whether the the, the defense can actually privatize or not so this is a very natural question normally people ask can we really do this kind of nuclear power privatizing nuclear power uh, so I think uh, we have to really think about all this thing so privatizing nuclear power means you are trying to create a provision of tradability now creating a tradability is having an allocative externality per se so this is one case again oh, human organs transplant and all have an indirect externality then you have a problem with paternalism we'll discuss that later so what can be privately on this is actually a, a question which is immediately emanates from the three examples which we have uh, mooted earlier public versus private good in the first case, so let's talk about private good. Rival risk on consumption precludes another excludable technological possible to prevent consumption. For example, Apple. What about a public no rival, non excludable example, defense against the nuclear attack? So, can we privatize it? Infrastructure, road bridge, etc. Box, clean air, large fireworks, displays, etc. These are actually normally we would argue under private. Now, if it can be provided by a private agent well and good but actually what about the allocative externality if allocative externality is zero then you can definitely go for it but if you have an allocative externality which is very positive then you cannot uh, privatize the same so this is a problem with uh, why some good cannot be uh, privatized or so why some good should be privatized question okay so uh, we had already discussed this in earlier lectures in different papers so therefore i'm not going to the details of it and public uh, in that context when private goods are owned publicly they tend to do over utilization of or exploitation of resources which is we called tragedy of commons this is the famous quotation which we keep discussing the garrett hardin's paper the biologist paper in so uh, the tragedy of commons is nothing but when private goods are owned publicly they tend to be over utilized so if the characteristics of the commodity is private then it is being provided by public then definitely that is going to be overutilized so this is a kind of tragedy which is uh, in common sense so when public goods are privately owned they tend to be underutilized for example something which you cannot so people cannot use uh, because of the nature of the good public good all right what would be the tragedy of Fante Commons? So this is the result which we have seen in the uh, in the store friends of uh, Russia, uh, the USSR, elsewhere USSR. After the disintegration, the uh, the rights, uh, the public rights, are uh, being traded uh, uh, and it is being distributed by different um, private uh, departments. It becomes a different private departments issue. But what happened is that uh, in the in the uh, paper which was uh, Mike, uh, written by Michael Heller appeared in the Yale Law Review 
I guess, yeah, it is in the lay a low review. So that paper is basically discussing a very important question. That is, suppose if you have a public right which was being uh, allocated privately, then what would be the result? Store friends are empty because uh, you can't use your right because you have to move different public departments to get your rights now. This is also uh, a context where uh, uh, Michael Heller had uh, written about another paper which is about the, in the in intellectual property rights. In, uh, so in the gridlock economy, uh, which was the book he wrote in, in 2008 and earlier there are two papers which was uh, written by him are all reflective of the strategy of anti government. That is, if you have too much rights, private rights, then you cannot use the property. So the result is a tragedy of anti common So efficient suggestion is being made by um, Buchanan and you in their paper symmetric commons. That is efficient suggestion so that is private goods should be privately owned and public goods should be publicly owned, which is all regulated. This is what is proposed by uh, uh, which is called the symmetric commons problem. So this accords with the principle we just saw that is when you have a problem from the law and economic perspective and you have a transaction cost low, facilitate a voluntary trade, private good, low transaction cost, private ownership facilities. When you have a transaction cost which is uh, high, and allocate right efficiently public goods high transaction costs so public provision regulation of public goods requires to get efficient amount so a different view of the transaction cost is clean a large number of people affected by the transaction high injunctive relief unlikely to work well and still two options so one give property owner right to clean air protect by damage or two public regulation. So argue for one or the other by comparing cost of each, damage cost are legal cost of lawsuit or perennial negotiations, regulation administration to cost, error cost if level is not chosen correctly. So what can an owner do with this property? This is another set of questions of the fourth set of questions which we are coming into that is principles of maximum liberty for example. So what he can do with his property? So owner can do whatever they like with their property provided it does not interfere with other property or rights. That is, you can do anything you like so long as it doesn't impose an externality on the other. So this is very important because we have already seen that in the public good case. If you have an allocative externality, you cannot own that privately. So this is a problem. Again, the same is the case with the uh, example of the the externality which is organ transplantation case that is an indirect externality problem the two principles were established in this ownership this is what is called the first position and then the tied up case we have already discussed this in the beginning itself that is in the lectures of one and two we had discussed about this that is the first position is nobody owns fugitive property until someone possesses it First to capture a resource on it. This is the principle and tied up ownership is actually on of fugitive property tied to something else here. We had already seen both the case in the case of whale hunting and all. So ownership already determined before resources is extracted. And uh, Central can be quiet on all the gas and in the case salmon would own some of the gas since under his land. So principle of access. A new thing is owned by the owner of the proximate or the prominent property. So this brings us to the following trade-off that is rules that link ownership possession have the advantage of being easy to administer and the disadvantage of providing incentive for uneconomic investment in possessory acts. So rules that allow ownership without possession have the advantage of avoiding preemptive investment and the disadvantage of being costly to administer. Now, when, when should resource become privately owned? So this is the uh, question. Uh, it is not only a question of uh, ownership, but it is now a specific question of private ownership. So we already saw two doctrines so for how ownership rights are determined. First position, tied up ownership. Next question, when should a resource become privately owned? Cost of private ownership is uh, owned must take steps to make uh, the resource excludable, that is, you should have a boundary to maintain it and boundary maintenance 
and foster public ownership, which is also a conjunction of your offer use. So an economically rational society will privatize the resource at the point in time when boundary maintenance costs less than the waste from overuse of resources. This is very pertinent because otherwise this is either because of conjunction or congestion or uh, what worse or because boundary maintenance becomes cheaper. So either of this case only you privatize otherwise it's very difficult to privatize. And with this uh, I would actually um, in this lecture and uh, thank you uh, thanks all to listening to this lecture thank you once again